Anyway. Hi, people. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 All right. So I told the last service that I promise uh, the next time, if they let me back up here, we'll we'll talk happy stuff. Cause I know the first time I said it was like it's not me, it's you, and so it made you guys go home and study yourself. <laughs> And then last, the last time I was up here, I told all y'all, you're going to hell. <laughs> and so now I'm questioning your authenticity as a Christian. So next time, we'll, it'll be like sunshine and rainbows, I promise. <laughs> Just not today. <laughs> all right, let's dig into this. My timer is timing. So how many people have heard this before? You're out, you know, doing whatever, and someone comes up to you and says, so you call yourself a Christian. Anybody heard that before? The question, the comment or whatever, because you out, you know, living life, being a human being, and someone comes up to you like, man, can you believe this girl? Can you believe this guy? He calls himself a Christian. Today, we're going to dig into this a little bit, and we're going to find the root cause of it, and we're going to find the appropriate way to respond. Amen? Amen. 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 He's going to beat me up for doing this, but can we give a great God bless you to my man, Rob Miller, in the back? The professor, he's all the way in the back. He's going to fight me after that. So Rob Miller is the other keyboard player here, um, and I'm, the reason why I'm giving him a shout out is because here at Grace Walk, we have such buy-in for our musicians that they come to church even when they're not playing. And that is... Speaking as a church musician, that is uncommon. If we're not playing, then we're going somewhere else where we can play. And so for us to have the buy-in for our musicians to come and receive the service and receive the word, even when they're not uh, participating, is huge. We have one of the best worship programs this side of heaven. And I'm not just saying that because I'm over it. I'm saying it because it's true. Amen. Amen. All right. So... How many people here call themselves a Christian? It's so funny. So you guys are probably the most enthusiastic when I've asked that question. 8.30, they were like, I, I think so. <laughs> 10 o'clock was like, maybe, I don't know. It depends on what the follow-up question is. <laughs> so in order to delve into this concept, we, fu- we first must ask ourselves, What does it mean to be a Christian? The answer is very, very simple. We are just sinners saved by grace. We are people who are navigating this world the best that we can, but the difference between us and those who are not saved is that we have an entity, a deity, that gives us hope and belief and daily portions of grace and mercy. The reason that we are segregated, set apart from everybody else, is that we know how to go to God in our brokenness. And so two things that make us saved, we must first confess and then we believe. That's it. Don't let anybody else tell you anything else otherwise. There are no more qualifications to being saved. You just need to confess and believe. That's it. Everybody in this room used to be a former something. Some of us are probably still a little bit of something. But... And, you know, let's be honest, some of us may be a future something, but at the end of the day, we still know a God that we know how to pray to, that we can ask for forgiveness and grace and mercy, right? Right. So while we do that, can we start to example that same grace and mercy to our fellow brothers? Yeah, because it's a concept that we hold near and dear to our own faith walk, but sometimes we have a hard time with the application when it applies to other people, right? So, you call yourself a Christian, right? Let's see what that really means. Faith without works is dead. Anybody heard that before? Right. But we probably heard that in the wrong application. So, let's unravel the way that we've been hearing that for so many years, and let's try the true application. The book of James... Let's uh, turn our phones and our Bibles and our iPads and anything else to the book of James. 
Second chapter, 14th verse, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Surely that faith cannot save, can it? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and, says, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Yeah, I know, I know. I've been reading this scripture wrong a lot myself because in this moment, we've always been talking about faith without works being dead for our own personal petitions to God, right? We always want to use this scripture when we say, well, I'm believing in God but for a job, but I haven't applied for it. Faith without works is dead. I'm looking to God for a miracle for my health, but I won't go to the doctor. Faith without works is dead. This scripture has absolutely nothing to do with that. This scripture has been taken out of context for so many years. It has nothing to do with your own personal petition. James is actually charging us to say, if you're walking around calling yourself a Christian, but you're not acting like it to your brothers and sisters, then that means nothing to them. Because how are you going to step over them when they have a need and then turn around and say, hey, won't you come to church with me on Sunday? For what? Why would I go to church with you when you can't even see me in my place of need right now? And Jesus is sitting back with his arms crossed like that whole Burger King meme that I know all of you guys have seen. And saying, I'm not being represented well. Because right now, I need our actions to line up with our declarations. And in this moment, instead of saying, you can't win if you don't play, in all honesty, the true Christianity in us means something way different. It means that we can't walk by our brothers in need when it comes time to profess our faith because God has charged us to one, love him, and two, love each other. Amen. We can clap for that. Yeah, absolutely. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we live out our faith in practical ways? Are we providing for those who have less than us? Are we exampling Christ's love and compassion and, uh, and righteousness in our daily lives? Or are we walking around playing Captain Correction every time we see somebody failing? Are we walking around in our self-righteousness because we met God a couple of days before someone else did and we think that we have this stronghold on our vertical relationship? Everybody in this room, the only difference between you and the next Christian is the day that you met God may be in a different day from someone else. Amen? Amen. And that only means that you're further in line when it gets to heaven because you died first. So let's consider even what Jesus said in this moment. Jesus said to the Pharisees in the book of Matthew, you read it on your own time. In the book of Matthew in the 23rd chapter, he said to the Pharisees who were known, biblically known, for upholding the law. They did a great job of upholding the law, but they had no love in their heart. And you know what Jesus called them? He called them whitewashed tombs. Because in this moment, if you can uphold morality, but I can't see Jesus within you, then it, it serves no purpose to our evangelizing. So in this moment, we have to ask ourselves, for those who decide that they want to play Captain Correction all the time, what will you do <laughs> when you are the first one to be exampled when you fall yourself? And you will fall. The Bible says that all of us fall short of God's glory and God's grace. So in that moment, how can you stand on this platform and feel like you're better than someone else when the only difference between the two of you is that you decided to change your ways a couple of days before somebody? And then ask yourself this. When we are evangelizing, the authenticity of our vertical relationship is negated when you grab somebody by the neck and force them to the altar. Do they really love God or are they just afraid because of the image that we have portrayed about if you continue to do things the wrong way, 
the consequences of not having a relationship. I don't know about you saints today, but I'd rather love God because I want to, not because somebody put a gun to my head. And so in that moment, we can go to the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter. It's a very familiar passage. This is the King James Version with all the thou's and thine's and, and wilts. And it says, judge not that ye may not be judged, for with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. What's crazy is this, well just, this well-dressed gentleman is out on this crusade to go correct everybody, but he didn't even fix his own sign. <laughs> the Bible is very clear. If you take out all the thou's and thine's and wilts in this, it's very clear it's saying two things. One, before you go around correcting everybody else, you might want to fix your own life. And second, once you fix your own life, instead of standing on this platform thumping your chest about how great you are, you need to go get your brother and get him right too. Because how much more powerful is it when we walk through this world together? The problem that we have here in the church is that we want to wait till the end of the testimony to tell it. And think about how much more powerful your testimony will be if you looked at somebody dead in the face and said, Jasmine, I know where you have been because I'm still there. Amen. Not I've been there, but I'm still struggling. I'm still dealing with this. I know what it feels like to be hopeless and addicted and suicidal. So instead of waiting for me to finish this so that we can um, come to a conclusion and I can tell you where I've been, how about we walk through this life together? The Bible says, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We always want to wait till we're out of the storm to tell somebody else how to get out of it themselves instead of walking through the storm together and getting out of it together and celebrating our victory together and lifting up the name of Jesus. The book of Luke says the very same thing. The book of Luke says, And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in his own eye. This sounds just like the other scripture in Matthew. Either how can thou say to thy brother, brother, let me pull out the mote that's in my eye when thou thyself behold not the beam that's in his own eye. Thou hypocrite, he said it twice, hypocrite. Cast out first the beam out of thine own eye and then shall thou see clearly to pull out the mote that's in thy brother's eye. It's two times now where the Bible has said, man, you need to take out whatever's in your own eye so you can see clearly and immediately go help your brother out before you start celebrating how you can see. And I love this version in Luke because in Luke it says in, in verse 40, the disciple is not above his master. Church, let me ask you this. Do you guys know anybody who was super spiritual? Y'all know them extra saints? You know, you know the ones who, every time you ask them a question, the response is either some song title or some parable or some scripture or some verse from their favorite uh, um, song that they listen to on the radio. You ever get to those people where, like, you're trying to get directions to the church, you're at 75th and Lower Buckeye, and you say, well, hey, how do I find the church? Well, trust in the Lord and lean not to your own, left or right. The light is green, there's cars behind me honking, left or right. Does anybody know anybody like that? Or are you? You put your hand right back down, didn't you? You're like, well, I don't feel I know somebody, I'm not that person. 
Does anybody know somebody like that? Or are you that person where every time someone says something to you, you have to give them the extra churchy answer, the extra spiritual answer, and we wonder why churches all over this country have empty seats? Because in this moment, we're not taking the best example to love by compassion and bring people in by enticing them for a better way instead of condemning their existing way. We are here to offer Christ, not denigrate your ways. Anybody have children in this place? We know that there's two ways that we can coerce our children to do what we need them to do. We can either threaten them within an inch of their life, or we can reward their good behavior. You get straight A's, I'll take you to Chuck E. Cheese. I'll buy you some Jordans or whatever. We can try that route, or we can say, man, if you get another F, then it's wraps. You know, I will introduce you to Jesus way before you want to. You know, I, I believe it was a Cosby show where he said, I brought you in this world and I'll take you out. <laughs> and in that moment, again, we don't understand that what we're doing is all, we're it's stoking fear instead of creating reverence. We're supposed to bring hope to the hopeless, not threaten people into believing into a God that's going to flip the light switch and cause chaos every time he doesn't get his way. Newsflash, God ain't been getting his way since the beginning of time. And he still has been exampling grace and mercy and favor and provision. You've benefited from it, so why can't we do the same for other people? The reason why everyone has gotten to a place where they've called us hypocrites is because we have not made church fun. But sin is fun. Can we be real today? Sin is fun. I'm looking at young people, so I'm not going to get super graphic. But the things that we're not supposed to do are fun. Correct? Is it just me? Maybe it is. Sin is fun. I know they're going to like, cut this clip and put it on YouTube, and they're like, oh, my God, this, this guy at church said sin is, sin is fun. I didn't say we're supposed to do it, but it's, sin is fun. That's why it's the alternative. That's why it's so hard for us to follow Christ, because the alternative is the sexy alternative. It feels good when we're inebriated and we're walking in our own ways and not listening to somebody else. It is rebellious in our nature. That's why we have to choose God. Because if he wanted to, he could snap his fingers and we could just all fall in line. But that's not being his child, that's being his slave. And today we are declaring that we are heirs to the throne because we chose to honor God as our father. Amen. Amen. Grandma used to say you'd get more flies with honey than with vinegar. And so I charge again today that we examine ourselves from the perspective of evangelizing and ask everywhere we go, are we really going to be a light in darkness or are we indistinguishable from the world? The impact that we have right now is so vital because right now people can't tell the difference between us and the world. We got a vice president that's calling the former president a rapist. We got a president that's calling the vice president a whore. And we got a whole lot of people in the middle saying, where's God in this? I don't care who you vote for, but you cannot stand on Christian principles and excuse that behavior from either side. The Bible is very, very clear. I think uh, a lot of people think that there is a Christian allegiance to one side of the political aisle, but when you have not love in your heart, you are not exampling God. Amen. And that goes for either side. Amen. And it is up to us as the church to reinstate kindness and godly love in this moment. Vote for who you want to vote for, but do it because that person aligns with your ideology, not because the other person is whatever name 
that's being called this week. It's disgusting, it's disgraceful, and the church needs to stand up and say, stop it. <laughs> Romans 12, the ninth chapter, says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Somebody say that. Keep on praying. Mm. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. The commandments are very simple. Love God, love each other. In the word, he stopped right there. He said, these two are more important to me than anything else. But right now, we've got a culture that, that thinks that if you actually follow the other eight, that you have a right to walk around condemning people for the first two. That's not how this works. You don't get to take number two off just because you followed number seven. We're supposed to love each other despite our differences. This is a hospital. How many times have you seen somebody go to the hospital when they're already healed? This is a place for the broken to come. But right now, culture has connotated that they have to be right before they come in these doors. That is impossible for us to fix the broken. And why? Because we are out here on this platform, we're pontificating. What that means is we are sitting on this platform condemning everybody because we have followed this one slice of righteousness and everyone else is completely aware of how we're ignoring the rest of it. And they're calling us to the carpet and it's about time that we listen. They're calling us to the carpet because we think that we got this right and we absolutely do not. We need to start loving each other despite our differences. If you're pro this and anti this, we need to start loving each other despite our differences. I asked somebody the other day, how can you be pro-life and pro-capital punishment? And they were like, huh? Because the Bible is very clear in the commandments about not killing each other, but we don't apply that to hunting and to taking magnifying glasses to ants. It wasn't just me when I was a kid. So don't kill them when they're babies, but if they steal a, a, a candy bar from Walmart, then it's off with their heads. That's what we believe right now. We're pro-life and we're pro-capital punishment. And the world is saying there's, there's hypocrisy in that. And instead of actually listening to them and embracing what we're hearing, we stand on this Christian platform because we think that we met God a couple days before them not realizing that we're not doing any good to bring others into Christ. It's real quiet in here, and that's okay. The book of Corinthians, the first chapter, we hear this all the time in weddings, and we hear this all the time in vow renewals, and, and it's a beautiful scripture, and it talks about how love is patient and love, love is kind, and love doesn't keep record of wrongdoing, and to be honest, it doesn't say it in the Bible, but love honestly should not keep record of right doing, because if you have to stand before somebody that you love and tell them everything that you've done for them, First Corinthians, the 13th chapter says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels and didn't love others, if I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, if I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all the knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I haven't gained anything. We wear Christianity like a sleeve. We weaponize our faith. And we don't realize it's not doing any good for the kingdom. But if we could be vulnerable in our brokenness then how much greater would that be for the benefit of those who are lost? The crazy thing is sometimes when we're going out looking for the lost, when we find them, we're just as lost as they are. 
Imagine that, just going out to the woods and find, hey, where are you? Where are you? Okay, I found you. All right, so how do we get home? Uh, I, I don't know. How about we both scream until the next person finds us and then we'll just... That's the point I'm trying to make, though, is that in this moment, we're no better than the people that we are out here trying to save. And from that platform of condescension, we're pushing them further away rather than embracing them back in. And it's time that the next time someone says something to you about you being a hypocrite in your faith, maybe we should listen. Maybe we should ask ourselves, what are we doing that's causing this stigma to be attached to our faith because the people out in the world, they're not doing us any favors. But here at Grace Walk, you have an opportunity to be a light in darkness by grabbing people who are out in the world and offering them hope instead of condemning what they're doing. We offer them a, a, a ray of sunshine instead of just complaining about where they are right now because somebody did that for you. Somebody reached out and grabbed you and walked you to the altar together and kneeled beside you at the altar and prayed with you instead of standing over you and said, man, if you don't. And I know I told y'all y'all going to hell last time I preached. <laughs> so don't email me next week. Well, you said we was going to hell. Don't, don't email me next week and say that. I know what I said. And if you were listening, what I was saying is that in this walk, you're going to go through some dark places. And when you come out of it, you don't get to thump your chest and say, I made it. You turn around and you grab your brother who is in the same dark place and you bring them out as well. And one by one by one by one by one, the kingdom gets bigger. Oh boy. So, Dylan's not here, is he? He was at the last service. Okay, so, Dylan, <laughs> are you, you praise God because he's not here? It was, it was weird timing. Chappie was like, he's not here, praise God, amen. <laughs> Dylan is our uh, prayer coordinator now, uh, him and his wife. Um, and we're excited about what, where God is leading the church in the prayer ministry because it's so vital to the church. Dylan and I uh, went to Dunkin' Donuts over on 67th, right off of I-10, earlier this, this past week. And Dylan has these two twin baby girls, beautiful baby girls. Yeah. And his wife was at work, and we're sitting there. I've got a, a hat that says, God is dope. He's got a church shirt that says, whatever church. And we're just sitting there doing life. And, you know, we're both girl dads. I've got a daughter. She's not a baby anymore. She's actually on camera back there. Uh, yeah. See, that's the nice dad. See, the, 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 the regular dad is like, all right, that's my daughter. Uh, but see, now, I, and I call myself a Christian. Exactly. See, that's my point. So Dylan and I are at Dunkin' Donuts last week, and we're sitting there doing life. I'm getting to know him. I'm the worship director here at the church. He's the prayer coordinator, him and his wife here at the church. We're getting to know each other. We're trying to figure out how we can partner together and, and enhance the kingdom principles here at the church, right? And so he's got these two baby girls, and they're, they're, they're infants, and they're rambunctious, and they're being babies, and they're, they're throwing Cheerios, and one of them's crying because she's hungry. The other one is crying because one of them's being held. It's a whole situation. I'm holding one and patting her, and he's holding the other one and patting her, and we switch. And so I grab the other one, and it's this whole situation, and in walks this lady. Yeah, we're going there. Yep. <laughs> In walks this lady. It's so funny seeing you guys starting to go, oh, Lord. One by one, people, oh, no, oh, oh, oh. Yep, it happened. She walks in, and she starts looking. She orders her latte, and she keeps looking. She sits down with her laptop, and she's typing, and she's looking over her shoulder. And long story short, it happens. She walks up. I just want you to know that what I think you're doing is disgusting. I'm sorry that talking about church matters at my, my church offend you because that's exactly what happened. 
Hi, I'm Reggie. I'm the worship director over the church around the corner. This guy's over prayer. We're both married, not to each other, but to, to other people. I, I see, you're getting ahead of me. She said, did you invite her to church? You're getting ahead of me. So in that moment, she picked the right and wrong person to have this conversation with. The right person because if I wasn't saved, she would have got cussed out. And if she caught me on the wrong day, because I ain't no killer, but don't push me. I didn't know all y'all like Tupac. He said, come on now, that's hilarious. And you call yourself a Christian. <laughs> so, in that moment, I had to explain to her, hey, I'm the worship director at the church around the corner, and this guy is the prayer coordinator at the same church, and we're, we're doing life. We're not married to each other. These babies are his. We didn't adopt these Scandinavian babies off the internet like this. <laughs> These are his babies. We're both girl dads. Like, you know, it's, it, and, and what, what's amazing is in that moment, rather than have any contrition, she just, she just doubled down. And so this is a moment of evangelizing. So to answer your question, absolutely. Yes. Come on by the church. We got a spot right here in the front. And I even told her, I was like, hey, you come on, I'll, I'll give you a shout out. Hey, everybody, this is the woman. <laughs> Remember that story I told you about Dunkin' Donuts? I said, hey, 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 Karen, how you doing? Thank you for coming to church. I don't know what her name was. <laughs> but in that moment, we had the responsibility to show her a light and darkness rather than reciprocate ignorance for ignorance. So, to wrap all this up, when someone says you call yourself a Christian, you respond, yes. Yes, I am. Yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I'm a broken person who is saved by grace. Yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I am maybe not exampling that right now. You may not see God in me right now. Oh, but he's there. I trust me when I tell you he's there. Yes, I am a Christian. I was a wretch undone and God saw my faults and still loved me exactly how he created me. Yes, I am a Christian. I, 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 I skipped this part. Because I got excited. But fellas, make some noise in this place today. Yes. <laughs> fellas, hear me well. I'll be brief. Everything you feel, every emotion that you feel is valid. Everything you feel. The world has tricked you into thinking that you can't be insecure that you can't be body conscious, that you can't be, uh, have self-esteem issues, that you can't have problems that make you feel emotional, that you can't cry, that you can't do this and that and the third, and the devil and all his friends are a lie. You know why I tell you that? It's because we have condemned men into thinking that they can't have these emotions, but they still have them. And what happens is now we don't know how to address emotions that still exist. And now we're walking around here wondering if we're even supposed to be a man. We've got an identity crisis now. I'm gender fluid. Well, I'm not drinking it. The Bible is very clear. How God made you is how God made you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You can email me all day long, but the Bible is very clear. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when you question your identity, you question God. And that is not the design because God made you how he made you so that somebody else can see him in you. Emotional vulnerable, compassionate, just like the Holy Spirit is within us. Emotional, compassionate, vulnerable. 
We don't have a God that is so stern that we can't come to him. So why are we questioning men to be like that? My email is reggie at gracewalkchurch.org. I dare you. Try me. Call me this week. We can have that conversation. The Bible is extremely clear about that. How you are made is exactly how God wants you to be. He does not make mistakes. Anyway, the book of Galatians. <laughs> the book of Galatians says, From now on, let no man trouble me, for I bear on my body the scars of Yeshua. Another uh, variation of the Bible says, Let no man trouble me, for I bear the marks of Jesus Christ. I, I, bear, I bear the... That was a happy coincidence, by the way. We used a, an AI platform to make our picture, and it just came out as a teddy bear. And I already had the scripture. I was like, oh, well, oh, I get it. I bear the... But this is exactly how we are. We're walking down the street battered and ripped and torn and still smiling because God has created us just how we are. And when people walk by us, the first thing they look at is like, how do you look like that? And you're still smiling. That is your moment to evangelize right there. That's your moment to say, when I was a wretch undone, God saw my faults and I'm still standing here blessed. I'm still standing here with hope. I'm still standing here healed. And he has supplied all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He's able to exceed abundant above all we can ask or think, and it's not predicated on how many sins you have committed. He is able to reach you. So, yes, when someone says, you call yourself a Christian, your response is, absolutely I am. Yes, amen. And I know you may not be able to see it within me because I just flipped you off for cutting me off in traffic. <laughs> I know you may not be able to see it in me because you saw me dropping it like it's microwavable in the club last week. But I know God. And thank you for bringing it to my attention because now I'm going to do a better job of acting like I know God. Because the world is watching. The world is watching. And it's time for us to be a light in darkness. It's time for us to stop talking about Trump, stop talking about Harris, start talking about Jesus. Yes. Yes, I am a Christian. And you can be one too. You can have this grace. You can have this mercy. We need to start being vulnerable. Yes, I'm broken. Yes, I've made mistakes. Yes, I've stumbled. Yes, I've fallen. And the same God that I'm telling you about will do the same for you. Right in your brokenness, right in your suicidal state, right in your addiction, God will pick you up right out of that muck and that miry clay and he will dust you off and you can be just as brand new as you think I am. Yes, I am a Christian. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this place today. If you are tired of running from God, if you are tired of people holding you accountable for some relationship that they think you're supposed to have, and you want to be free to declare your love for God in your brokenness, can you just let your hands rest in the air? I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your willingness to be vulnerable in this moment. We don't have to be super complex. Repeat after me, church. Lord, let it begin 
with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace Walk, we're going to take this world back for the kingdom. It's time for us to start repeating the truth louder and more times than we hear the lies. It's time. It's time. It's time. Part-time Christians cannot defeat full-time devils. There was a quote I was going to read you from Martin Luther King. It doesn't matter anymore. He just says that the, the, the worst type of atheism basically is Christians who walk around acting like they know God, but they're not treating each other right. It's time. It's time for us to start loving one another the way that God has loved us. It's time for us to start exampling what it means to be an upright, law-abiding vitamin eaten Christian the way that we have learned when we were kids. It's time for us to start loving one another despite what the world says about us. Yes, we are hypocrites. Yes, we walk around here acting like our stuff doesn't stink. And it's time for us to start reversing that stigma because the devil does not take a day off. You guys remember Forrest Gump? When it was raining? And Bubba said to Forrest, if we stand together back and back, we won't have to sleep with our heads in the mud. It's time for us to take our heads out the mud. It's time for us to start making Jesus famous. It's time for us to be that light in darkness. It's time for us to really example what it means to be a Christian. It's time for people to start questioning, excuse me, stop questioning that and start declaring, wait, man, you call yourself a Christian. When we walk the walk, people change around us. When we walk the walk, you get to work and they stop talking. Cra- oh, no, no, I ain't going to say that in front of him because he's saved. Right, you know those people. That, that they change their behavior around you. I'm not going to cuss in front of this dude because he knows God. And you know the next thing, they just stop cussing altogether. I'm not going to drink around this person because he knows God. And next thing you know, they've just they've walked away from it altogether. We have the power to break chains when we work together. <laughs> So it's time. It's time. I always say, don't leave this place the same way that you came. In Jesus' name. But it's time for us to start loving on one another and showing them the same God that we celebrate. So that there's no question. Yes. Yes, I call myself a Christian. Amen. Thank you.